Hi there, this is Anna. Last video we began exploring morphology, learning about morphemes and their structural importance to our English language. Now today we're going to divide morphemes into two distinct subsets, free morphemes and bound morphemes. So their titles are quite useful in helping us to understand which type of uh, morpheme each one is and we can summarize it like this. A free morpheme can stand alone, a bound morpheme cannot. The bound morpheme must be bound to another morpheme. It might be bound to another bound morpheme or it could be bound to a free morpheme. So for example, if we were to take the word dogs, there are two morphemes in dogs as we discovered in the last video. We have the word dog and the dog is a free morpheme because it can stand alone, it has its own unit of meaning. And then we have the S, which gives us some functional information about the word dog telling us that there's more than one. It's plural information and it's a bound morpheme because S on its own doesn't mean anything. It has to be attached to the free morpheme there. So therefore it's a bound morpheme. It doesn't carry its own meaning. So let's check out some other free morpheme, bound morpheme combinations to make sure that we understand the difference between the two. Our first word that we have here is unhappiness. So let's first of all, step one, break up unhappiness into the different morphemes. We have un, we have happy. Now you'll notice that there's an I in happy instead of a Y. And of course, sometimes when we add an affix or a bad morpheme onto a free morpheme, we do have to alter the spelling uh, in order to accommodate that. But still happy is still the free morpheme in that. And then we have ness. So there are three morphemes in this. Un is changing the meaning of the word. It's a derivational morpheme here. It's changing the meaning of the word. And ness is changing the uh, form of the word. So it's converting the word from an adjective happy to the noun happiness. Okay, uh, so there we have two bound morphemes. So this one is a bound morpheme, this one is a bound morpheme, and this one is a free morpheme. Okay, three morphemes, bound, free, bound. Let's have a look at the next word. The next word is amoral. So first steps, we have to divide amoral into the two morphemes that it is. We have a and moral. And moral here is our free morpheme. It's the one that's providing the uh, meaning, can stand all alone. A, on the other hand, is actually changing the meaning. It's giving a negative context from being moral to being amoral, okay? So that's a derivational morpheme. It's a bound morpheme. So in this instance, we have two morphemes one bound and one free. And here's our final word, it is curiosity. So let's just get my green texture for that. And I once again think that we have two morphemes in this. We have curious, which is um, an adjective, and then itty, which is turning the adjective into a noun. So once again, I've used a derivational morpheme, that's interesting. So here we go, this is the free morpheme curious, and then itty is our bound morpheme. So what this shows us is that when we're looking at free morphemes and bound morphemes when they're put together, uh, they can be put together where the bound morpheme is stuck onto the front, where the bound morpheme is stuck onto the end, or it can be stuck, one, it can be stuck onto both. Um, but when they are stuck onto both, they have different meanings. So in those instances where we have a bound morpheme that is attached to a free morpheme, we call this these bound morphemes affixes and we call the process of adding an affix to a free morpheme like this it's called affixation or in some cases we call it agglutination but we're going to call it affixation for the purpose of this video so we're going to be talking about affixes now and there are four different types of affixes all these affixes are bound morphemes they all have to attach to a free morpheme for them to exist as affixes and the different types of affixes that we have are these four here. The prefix, the suffix, the infix, and the circumfix. 
and I'm hoping that from your knowledge of prefixes and things, you could almost figure out which one is which, but I'm going to go through them with you anyway, just in case. So here we have it here, got it all written out for you. The prefix is an attachment of the affix to the front of a free morpheme. So affixes such as co in co-create, un in unambiguous, and dis in disloyal are all examples of a prefix. Suffix is an attachment to the end of a free morpheme. So affixes such as ation in starvation, ik in heroic, and the ing in playing are examples of a suffix. Now, both of these prefixes and suffixes occur regularly in our standard English language. We do, however, have these additional infix and circumfixes, and they don't exist in our standard English language. However, the infix does exist in our non-standard Australian varieties. We use infixes such as bloody in fan bloody tastic but there are languages other than English that have infixes that is part of their standard grammars. And the discussion of these are really out of the scope of my videos because I'm really only talking about the English language. Um, but you will come across them if you study other languages. Now the final affix type is the circumfix, which relies on part of the affix placed at the beginning of the free morpheme and the other part at the end, essentially surrounding the word. In English, we can put affixes at the front and end of a free morpheme at the same time, but they are not part of the same affix. They are two different affixes playing two different roles. And so this is not considered a circumfix. In fact, I don't think that you will ever see a circumfix in the English language. I know certainly that German has circumfixes, uh, but again, this is out of the scope of the videos. Um, as, because it's not English grammar and there might be other languages as well that have the circumfix but we won't be seeing it again in our studies here. Okay, so before we sign off today we're going to have a little mini quiz. Firstly, in each of the following words we need to identify which is the free and which is the bound morpheme and then once we've done that we want to decide what type of affix it is. Is it a prefix or a suffix? I have not included infixes um, because they're not part of our standard English varieties, just our non-standard varieties. Um, I'll only wait a moment on the videos before I go through them, uh, so it might be worth hitting a pause now and uh, then I'll start. Okay, so our first word here is friendly and in this instance I believe that we have two um, morphemes. We have friend and we have li. And friend, I think, is our free morpheme. And li is our bound morpheme. And I think that it's a bound morpheme, it's on the end, so therefore it's a suffix. And of course the purpose of this suffix is to turn the noun friend into the adjective friendly. So it's actually changing it's uh, the, the class of the word. Okay, so now let's move on to explosion. And I've included explosion because I just want you to see that sometimes it's not going to quite work. All right, and I want to show you why that's the case. Okay, so we'll take the word explosion. And we, I think we can pretty quickly see that X is a common prefix uh, that usually means out. And we have a suffix the ION there is a suffix, which is often a um, suffix that changes the word class to a noun. So we've got these clearly identical affixes here. So this is a, an affix and this is an affix. However, that means that we're left with this word here, PLOS. Now, the way we understand we're able to be freestanding, and PLOS is not a freestanding morpheme. It actually comes from an old Latin word, plodere, which means to clap. Uh, and that's where explosion comes from. Uh, but it's no longer in use. It's no longer in English. And so here we have a situation where we've got two affixes that are clearly joined on to a root word, but, but the root has no meaning to us anymore. And so it's not freestanding. And so a little bit down the track in a couple of videos, I'm going to explain to you another way for us to classify 
morphemes rather than free and bound that can help us deal with situations like this one. All right, so we're going to definitely say that ION is a suffix. And we're going to say that EX is a prefix. So they're both types of affixes. But I think that's really the only conclusion we can come to at this point uh, in time for explosion. And we'll look at that again a bit down the track. All right, so now let's get back on to tiniest. Tiniest does very easily break up into free morpheme and bound morpheme. And we'll see how that's done. First of all, we can find the morphemes. We've got tiny and est. Once again, we've changed the Y on tiny into an I to accommodate the spelling of adding this, um, this bound morpheme here. Uh, we can say that this is a bound morpheme. And then of course, it's a suffix. And that this suffix is actually creating the superlative for a adjective. Um, and that means that this is the free morpheme here. Okay, tiny. Good. Okay, let's look at unsuccessful. Get my green pen for that. Unsuccessful, once again, we're going to just break it up into its morphemes first. So un is a morpheme. Success, I think, can't be broken down any further. And full. So here we have success, that's our free morpheme here. It's standing alone. We have un at the front, so that's a prefix. And it's a derivational prefix, which means that it's actually changing the meaning of the word from to the opposite, okay? And full, also a derivational pref uh, suffix. It's a suffix, it's a bound morpheme. I should say that's bound here, bound prefix. And this is a bound suffix. And that's telling us that it's changing the word class from the noun success to the adjective successful. So it's also a derivation, we'll learn about that soon. So here we have a prefix bound morpheme, a suffix bound morpheme, and a free morpheme in the middle, no problem. Okay, now we'll get to react. And once again, we can very clearly divide this into two morphemes. We have re, which is a very common prefix. Um, it's bound, meaning again, usually. Uh, and we have act on the other side, which is our free morpheme, okay? Let's keep going. We've got comical. Comical is once again, clearly defined into two morphemes. We have comic on one side, which of course is a noun, and then the A, and that's the free morpheme. And then we have the AL on the end, which is a suffix, a bound morpheme, which is a suffix, and it's playing the role to change comic into an adjective, comical, comic cool. suffix. Good. Okay, and the last one that we're going to look at today here is the word misguided. Uh, and I think I can see three morphemes in this one. We have miss, we have guide, and we have ed. I'm going to see, it's kind of down the middle really, isn't it? Because guide belongs to guide, but of course the suffix is ed on the end. Of course, in this instance, probably just had to put the d there, but... So we have guide is our free morpheme here. We have our bound morpheme here, which is a prefix. And you'll notice that the prefix are all down the left-hand side of the page. And then we have another bound morpheme at the end. Uh, and this time it's a suffix. And it's, it's giving a functional role of telling us that it's in the past tense. Uh, so that's what that morpheme is doing. So having put in these uh, affixes on the front or the end of our English words is the process of affixation. So that's that. So well done. Now, you may have noticed that the bound morphemes didn't always play the same role. Sometimes they serve to change the meaning of the words, such as the opposite meaning, like from successful to unsuccessful. And sometimes they serve to change the word class, such as from comic, the noun, to comical, the adjective. And sometimes they gave functional information, such as the ED um, on played. 
to tell that the playing happened in the past. Now, I have actually already posted a video about this quite a while ago now. And so if you haven't seen that video or you want to refresh under this new context, understanding about a little bit more about suffixes um, and affixes generally, then now's probably a really good time to go back and watch that video. I've placed a link below to help you find it. Um, and after that, once you've got that under your um, hat, uh, you can then return to this and uh, I'll be looking at lexical and functional morphemes, which is how we can break down our free morphemes. So if I show you in a table what I'm talking about here, here's a table of what we know so far. So we know that there are morphemes and we know that this morphemes can be broken into free morphemes and bound morphemes. And we know that the bound morphemes themselves can be broken up into inflectional and derivational morphemes. And, and that's what's shown in the video that I made earlier that I suggest you go and look at. Uh, what we're going to be looking at next is what happens here, up in this corner here. How can free morphemes be further subdivided? As we look at lexical and functional morphemes as a way of dividing up free morphemes. So until then, uh, thanks for watching. The Language Code.